Okay, so here we are to talk about Clifford Geertz uh, as uh, an example of an inheritor of the uh, Weberian approach to, uh, to uh, Weber was really thinking about sociology, but a Weberian approach for anthropology. Now, uh, Geertz um, sort of came into anthropology in the context of uh, a bit of a crisis of identity within the discipline. So early anthropologists uh, had been either convinced or were pitching anthropology as a science on par with other sciences, say like something like biology. But uh, this, uh, this idea started to come under um, fairly stern critique uh, after World War II uh, with ideas like culture itself, sort of the, the bread and butter of anthropological work, coming under uh, severe scrutiny. And, um, and, and it was shown to be a somewhat incoherent concept, at least the way that it was pitched in, um, in, in anthropological circles up to that point. We see something of that in the piece that, uh, that, that we read for today from Geertz. Now, this was a big blow to anthropology's um, sort of aspirations to have scientific authority. Geertz, in response, developed uh, what would come to be called interpretive anthropology. Sometimes it's called symbolic anthropology, though uh, really Geertz was more wedded to the idea of interpretive anthropology. And he developed this as a way of kind of restoring the scientific heft of anthropology, but doing it in a significantly distinctive way so that it wasn't falling afoul of all of the uh, criticisms that previous notions of anthropology, culture, and anthropology as a science experienced. So this piece that we're reading this week is uh, more his theoretical reflection on what it is that interpretive anthropology entails. The one we read next week is more of an example of what it looks like to do that kind of work. So here we're just looking at sort of his, uh, the way that he throws down the gauntlet to say, no, anthropology can be a science, but a science of a particular type. So he begins by discussing the culture concept. This, as I say, anthropology up until then had had culture as its calling card, that that was what anthropology studied, what anthropologists wrote about. Uh, we can see that to some extent when we read Malinowski's work and where he talks about things like a culture. And uh, as, as Geertz points out, when you try to pin down exactly what anthropologists meant by culture, you started to run into problems. And so he goes through Clive Cluckhorn's, Cluckhorn's uh, defense of, of the idea of culture to point out that Cluckhorn himself proposes dozens of definitions of what culture is. And that that poses a real problem. Why? Because when you're trying to pin down precisely what the thing is that defines your discipline, and you can't do it, that poses problems for the discipline as such. It throws into question what exactly it is that anthropology is doing. So he thinks that this is a pervasive problem. It's emblematic of all of the trouble that anthropologists had in uh, defining the discipline and of claiming it to have some kind of scientific rigor in the way that it studied its object, culture, exactly because it couldn't even say what culture was. So. Geertz proposes a distinctive approach. 
he claims what he calls a semiotic concept of culture. So semiotics is the study of signs. Uh, signs can be physical things, a stop sign, stoplights, those are semiotic signs, but uh, they can also be language. So that a word, in one concept of semiotics, a word is a sign. It's a linguistic sign, but it's a sign nonetheless. So that then language is constituted by signs. The important thing about signs then is that they mean things. They're meaningful units of uh, sound matter or of, of physical matter in the case of something like a, a stop sign. Um, that they're meaningful. So you can already see he's starting to orient his approach to the study of culture as constituted by meanings. And in this way, he positions himself as Weber's uh, descendant. He says, believing that man is an animal suspended in webs of significance, he himself has spun I take culture to be those webs, and the analysis of it to be therefore not an experimental science in search of law, but an interpretive one in search of meaning. Right. So then, this is this is a very important shift in the way that anthropologists are thinking about, first of all, culture, what it might be. More on that later. And second of all, how it is that anthropologists go about doing their work, what it is that they're studying. So here he's saying that we create webs of meaning. We suspend ourselves within those webs of meaning. And that the work of an anthropologist then is to interpret in search of meaning those webs in which we suspend ourselves. Okay, so that is uh, a nice sort of pithy phrase to capture what it is that he's concerned with. But then, okay, so what does that look like in practice? Well, it's worth noting that in Geert's view, what doing ethnography entails is not a question of methods. So you, you remember when Malinowski was writing about methods, or if you, if you read the piece, by Evans Pritchard when they're talking about methods, how anthropologists do their work in the field. Um, there was not a sort of detailed list of things of here's what you do when you get to the field. And there, there is good reason for that. No two studies are going to be exactly the same. So there's not going to be a single set of methods that you can just apply to all different projects. Geertz goes a bit further to, to suggest that actually methods are not really even the question. Rather, what anthropologists do is called thick description. And this is a term he borrows from uh, Gilbert Ryle. It doesn't matter where it comes from. This is uh, the, the point that he wants to get to is his elaboration of Gilbert Ryle's idea of thick description. Okay, so what do we see here? Well, on the surface, it's hard to tell. Is this eye winking at us? Is this just a blink? Is it meaningful? We don't exactly know. This is something that Geert picks up from Ryle. Ryle discusses winking and blinking. And then uh, Geert goes on to talk about parodying winking and blinking. And then practicing parodying winking and blinking. And so on. That each of these has the same mechanical features with respect to the eye. But in terms of meaning... They're doing quite different things. And in order to understand which it is that we're looking at, we need to do this anthropological work of interpretation. So a thin description would not just would not distinguish between those different things. Uh, uh, the difference between a reflex and a gesture is 
indistinguishable in thin description. Why? Because all a thin description does is describe the opening and closing of eyelids as a mechanical function, nothing, nothing beyond that. It has no notion that there can be different meanings behind opening and closing your eyelids. Again, this is the distinction that Geertz wants to draw so that we can start to consider what thick description entails. Now, a thick description is the work of ethnography then. The object of ethnography, according to Geertz, is a stratified hierarchy of meaningful structures in terms of which twitches, winks, fake winks, parodies, rehearsals of parodies are produced, perceived, and interpreted, and without which they would not, in fact, exist. So again, the point that he wants to get at with this is that we as anthropologists will observe some sort of um, bodily action, let's say, or it could be the utterance of some sounds. And our job is to get a handle on the stratified hierarchy of meaningful structures. So the different ways in which that action can be meaningful. It can be simply a twitch, in which case it has no more meaning than any other kind of reflex. It's not a meaningful action. It's not intended by the subject to be meaningful. It's not interpreted by those around the subject as meaningful, or at least it may be, but then it would be mistakenly so. And so in a sense, there's nothing there for the anthropologist to interpret because there's nothing social going on. However, once we start to be able to distinguish a, just a kind of twitch from a wink or a wink that's a fake wink that's meant to parody somebody else winking or somebody practicing his or her winks so that when the time comes to do a parody of a wink, the individual will just will have it down and will be able to time it perfectly, perhaps as a way of carrying off uh, some kind of a joke or of mocking somebody, whatever the case may be. That these are different layers of meaningfulness and the different uh, kinds of meaning will still have exactly the same mechanical function of the eye opening and shutting but that as anthropologists, what we want to be able to do is start to distinguish between these different layers of meaningful action, of meaningful behavior, so that we can tease out when somebody is, say, um, saying something earnestly, saying something in jest, saying something to mock somebody who said something earnestly, and so forth. We want to focus on meaning, in other words. So then ethnographic data is, as he says, our own construction of other people's constructions of what their compatriots are up to. Again, this idea of interpretations of interpretations. When we go into a social situation, then we're not concerned in sort of a flat way with what's going on in the circumstance we want to reconstruct for ourselves what it is that people in that situation are constructing amongst their compatriots, how people are making sense of one another in that situation. That's what we, in turn, interpret, and then we'll write down. So the facts of thick description are already explications of explications. We're already explaining how other people explain themselves and one another to themselves and to one another, and if you're lucky, to the anthropologist. Now, because Geertz approaches culture semiotically as meaningful structures or behavior as symbolic action, so not, not simply as kind of re reflexive or mechanical action, but as symbolic, he insists that it is also public. This is an important distinction, right? He's, he's saying that then we can't simply think 
on, say, something like a psychological plane where everything is just meaningful to the individual in solitude, but rather that, uh, like language, symbolic action is always public in nature. It's always social. It's always done with reference to others. And it always has to share in these common webs of meaning that within which a group of people is suspended or a community is suspended. So then the question that you ask in such a situation is what is getting said? He pauses to note that there are other approaches to culture and, and he lists them off to um, sort of negate them in turn. Now you might notice something, I'll just take a, a brief tangent here, you might notice something about Geertz's writing. Uh, if you're like me, you find this a slightly dissatisfying piece to read. Why? Because he seems incapable of simply stating something without going on a detour midway through his sentence and then coming back to his point. He's got all of these um, asides, all of these parenthetical clauses in the midst of what he's saying. And on the one hand, it seems like maybe what he's doing is he's just trying to flag along the way that he is aware of the opposing positions to the ones that he's presenting or the ones against which he's writing. And, okay, fair enough. Um, a slightly less generous interpretation is to say that he feels this sort of constant need to demonstrate his erudition, to show everything that he knows about everything, to show that he knows all of these different schools, to show that he can refer to things in a number of different languages. I think there are at least three different languages that he, he uses uh, to sort of um, show his intellectual and academic acumen along the way. And uh, if you interpret things that way, it becomes a little bit tedious. It's like, yes, yes, okay, Dr. Geertz, we get it. You're smart, you're well-read, fine. A third way that is, again, more generous, and the, and the way that I'm trying to warm up to, is the idea that he, all of these asides are like pausing during the telling of a story to wink at, a, at somebody in the audience to sort of let them in on a joke and to know that that he Geertz is performing in a certain kind of way so what we can do then as we read through this and as we hit all of his asides all of his interruptions of his own sentences to go off on a little tangent before returning to the point that he seemed to have wanted to make in the first place is to think of him as in a way, performing exactly what he's writing about. He's giving little nods and winks along the way to say, yes, I, I recognize that I am performing a certain kind of scholarly behavior, and I want you to be in on it. I want you to know that I'm doing it and know that I know that I'm doing it, so that in a sense we're on the same page. And then in a sense, I'm giving you an idea of how it is for you to be doing the anthropological work of interpreting my interpretations. I'm inviting you to do that kind of interpretive work. So that's, I find that a slightly more enriching way to understand his otherwise maddening tendency to go off on tangents. And so as you're reading, think of it in this way. Think of it as, as him giving you an opportunity, an invitation even, to start doing consciously the sort of interpretive work that he's writing about. He's giving you the winks and he's telling you that he's winking as he's doing it so that you can start to sort of get your hooks into how it is that an anthropologist would, would become tuned in to the way that whoever it is that you're watching 
is winking rather than just reflexively opening and shutting eyes rather than just blinking. Okay, that's it. So tangent over. Now back to the point. So he uh, very briefly and schematically goes over a number of the what he thinks of as sort of failed approaches to culture, the, the ones that have undergone all of this critique in, in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, and comes back to this idea that uh, we, we shouldn't think of culture as this kind of standalone entity, um, but rather as a shared public uh, thing. Later he'll call it a context that is public because meaning is so that when we shift our attention to culture as semiotic as having to do with signs and meaning then we can start to understand that culture is not something that lives in the brain so to speak but that lives between people the way that language does that meanings are always shared they're always public uh, he, he's sort of alluding to an argument that he gets from the uh, philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, he, he quotes Wittgenstein later in this piece, uh, where the idea is that you can't have a private language. Why? Because you could only build a private language on the back of a language that you already share with others. So the language, meaning, is only coherent when we think of it as shared, as public. So then, to follow that, you can't wink or fake a wink if you don't know what counts as a wink. Otherwise, it's just going to there's just going to be so much blinking going on in the world, none of it will be meaningful. You need to know what within the community you're you're within counts as a wink. What, what sort of meaningful work a wink does. So something counting as something already depends on shared criteria. And because they're shared criteria, criteria for what distinguishes a blink from a wink, they are, in advance we know, public. So then what keeps us who grow up winking other winks from understanding other social action is not a failure to understand how cognition works, right? So it's not a problem of, say, cognitive science or, or failure to understand cognitive science. It is rather a lack of familiarity with the imaginative universe in which their acts are signs. So that the same kind of um, action, the same kind of movement, the same kind of gesture at least mechanically the same, will not, from one community to another necessarily, have the same significance. It won't be the same kind of a sign from one to another, from one place to another, one community to another. And so if we want to, and here's where he quotes Wittgenstein, if, he wants to, if we want to go about finding our feet, with others who are unfamiliar to us. What we engage in is a process of becoming familiar with the imaginative universe in which their acts are signs. So that, um, by way of example, uh, in, in some yoga classes, they'll place their hands together, I guess at the end of the class, um, as, as a way of bringing the class to an end, right? So that that's a particular kind of movement it, with a particular kind of significance attached to it. In Thailand, on the other hand, where I did my field work, this is a way of greeting, and the significance of it has to do with the sort of reverence or respect you're showing to the person for whom you're per performing this gesture. It's called a why. So that if you want to demonstrate respect, then you dip your head further down. If you're somebody who is of higher status, say you're older than the person with, with whom you're uh, 
exchanging wise, then you don't dip your head quite as far because to dip your head further would be to diminish your own status. So there, there's then uh, the same physical gesture, the same mechanical gesture in these two contexts, these two imaginative universes, they'll have different meanings. Why? Because the, they're different publics. And so the meanings attached in these different publics are distinct from one another. And to perform the gesture the way you would in a yoga, yoga studio in the situation of inter, interacting with Thai people may mean that you perform it in a way that is frankly insulting. Why? Because you're trying to import one set of meanings that you think is uh, a way of being friendly into this imaginative universe where that gesture takes on a different set of meanings. It's embedded in a different set of webs of meaning. And so in order to perform it in the way that you would like to demonstrate congeniality, respect, friendliness, you need to be attentive to the semiotic system, the system of signs, the system of meanings in that time and place with those people so that you can do it in the way that allows them to interpret your gesture as a respectful, congenial, friendly gesture. So now, another way of saying that we try to find our feet with people, with people with whom we're unfamiliar, is that we seek to converse with them. So this involves more than just sharing a language, but also sharing criteria. This thing that I was just saying about what, what is the cr criteria for a respectful why? They are not going to be the criteria for how you bring about an end to a yoga class or how you greet people in a yoga class. Uh, so sharing criteria involves seeing what counts as, for example, a wink. All right. So again, not a matter of simply knowing the words, but of knowing how to use them within this group of people. Knowing that the sharing of words, if you wish to converse with these people, if you wish to find your feet with them, involves using the words in a way that reflects that you share criteria with them. Seeing a culture as an interworked system of construable signs, so signs that we can construe as meaningful between one another, is to see it not as a power that acts on us, but as a context. Now, seeing it um, as a power that acts on us, there he's He's sort of uh, very subtly referring to Durkheim's notions of social fact. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on them in a couple of weeks, where the idea is that, uh, very briefly, that social facts, for the purpose of this discussion, we'll just say culture, even though that's not what Durkheim talks about, uh, that culture exerts its force upon us. It impels us to behave in certain ways and not to behave in other ways. Now, for Geertz, when you shift your focus to semiotics, to a semiotic system, instead, he thinks that the idea of culture as a power that works on us somewhat misses the, the point, that rather what we see is that culture is a context. Again, if you think of that initial metaphor of webs of meaning we ourselves spin, that would be the context. A network of meanings is a context in which we can exchange meaningful gestures, signs. So then it's something within which social events, behaviors, institutions, and processes can be described. As the anthropologist, then, if we want to understand the particular signs, we need to appreciate how they hang within this context. Then studying the ordinary 
the ordinary he's saying is is this um, kind of arena of of behaviors of interactions of sociality that's often neglected because anthropologists uh, are are very often at least up until the time he was writing inclined to write about abstract structures kinship structures that are performed in reality but that have an abstract nature to them who can marry whom is uh, made up of these sort of abstract rules or they focus on big events uh, we see malinovsky talks about this as well and part of what malinovsky uh, discusses as the imponderabilia of everyday life are things that are ordinary and so Garrett's just trying to bring our focus to the ordinary so that we study the ordinary in places where it is unfamiliar which allows us to see how its meaning varies with the pattern of life that informs it. So then it's this process of understanding the ordinary elsewhere among people with whom we're unfamiliar that will render them accessible to us and though he doesn't say it like this indeed will render us accessible to them if they should be interested and so to this end anthropological interpretations of other symbol systems must be actor oriented so he's pushing back again against uh, an impulse to abstraction and saying that rather we need to focus on actors as they act within symbolic system, within the webs of meaning that they themselves spin. So actor-oriented interpretations or descriptions must stand up to the interpretations to which members of a denomination subject their experience. What does he mean by this? He means that if we offer interpretations that are at odds with the interpretations that the actors themselves give, then we're not getting it. We haven't found our feet with them. Rather, our interpretations as anthropologists have to be able to stand up to the interpretations that the actors themselves give. So that anthropology then claims to describe not facts that we capture, it's not, not sort of this compendium of facts, but rather what ethnography offers is a clarification of what's going on in some place. So that we can begin to see that behavior that initially is unintelligible to us when we're completely unfamiliar with it, becomes intelligible to us in a way that allows us both to describe it to the participants in a way that's recognizable to them, but also that allows us to provide an interpretation of their interpretations of what they're doing that is comprehensible to people who are not present there, who are not familiar, so that we can, uh, say, provide an explication of the system of, web, of the webs of meaning in which a community exists, acts, behaves, carries on meaningful lives. The task of ethnography then is, he says, to reduce puzzlement, to sort winks from twitches and real winks from mimicked ones. Reduce puzzlement then, not for the people with whom we're interacting, who we're, who we're trying to understand, they already have that in hand, but to reduce puzzlement first for ourselves as ethnographers, and then as we write it down, to reduce puzzlement for those who read our works. So because anthropological interpretation is the construction of a reading of what happens, the informal logic of actual life Coherence is not the validity test for cultural description. Why, he says? Well, because um, you can have, say, a scam artist who produces a beautifully 
coherent tale to try and persuade us to part, say, with our banking information. And he says, then we can we can be fooled by that. So it's not a perfect coherence that we want. We don't want to try and produce a perfectly coherent explanation and then have to shoehorn the facts into that perfectly coherent explanation. No, that that's not the test for the validity of a cultural description. The description has to stay close to what happens to the social discourse and clarify it rather than prioritizing an account that holds tightly together. So clarification is the goal for, to, towards which anthropologists strive. He says, cultural analysis is, or should be, guessing at meanings, assessing the guesses, and drawing explanatory conclusions from the better guesses. Right, so that there's built into this a kind of, a, for me, a refreshing kind of humility that as anthropologists, we start off making the best guess that we can. We're going to get things incomplete or sometimes simply wrong, but that through that, we gain a greater appreciation for what a better guess is. Why? Because it does a better job of explaining what's going on. And then as our guesses become better and better explanations, then we can start to uh, draw broader explanatory conclusions from them. So I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, a mistake that I was making early on in my field work when I was in Thailand. So I knew that you're supposed to, to greet people with the, with the why. Uh, I knew about the... Um, inclination of your head as an indicator of the degree of respect that you were showing to people and um, and and so I was uh, of course very uh, keen to show the appropriate respect wherever I could now uh, at the time I was staying in a, a hotel and it was right beside a canal and uh, underneath the bridge that went over the canal was uh, a walkway and uh, a soup stall, and I, I quite liked the uh, the soup there and and the the person who ran the the soup stall, and so I frequently went there to eat. Now to get from the hotel to the soup stall, I had to pass uh, a a place where uh, a grandmother and her granddaughter uh, had sort of set up a a, a place to sleep, and. Uh, so on my way by, I, I would always uh, greet the um, bo both the child and the and the grandmother, and I, I was informed l later on by a friend who recognized the mistake that I was making and recognized the implications of the mistake that I was making. That when I went and it was just the kid there, and I would initiate the why first, that I was making the mistake. Uh, why? Because she, as the younger and therefore the lower status person, is supposed to why me first and then I return the why. Uh, so you could see that as me having made a guess at a particular kind of behavior, what it means and, and how it's done, getting something wrong about it, but then by making that mistake and learning that my, my guess at how whying functions was off in this detail, I learned something about it. So learning something about how to do the why correctly is to learn about the meaningfulness of that gesture and is therefore to learn something about the forms of sociality around it more generally. It's to learn something about respect, about how respect is shown, about social propriety, and how social propriety is performed. And uh, it's also then to learn about how um, one can enhance or diminish one's own status by making small mistakes of this sort. Right. So that then my guesses at 
this aspect of Thai sociality became better. They, they were able to explain more and explain what they could explain better. This, I think, is what he's talking about then, is that we, by making, uh, by discovering that our initial guesses are not all that good, and then making better guesses, we also are able to explain more and better with our subsequent superior guesses. Okay, so now, he says, ethnographic description then has four characteristics. It's interpretive. Okay, so we've already covered that. It interprets the flow of social discourse. Okay, we've already covered that as well. What it, it interprets what people say amongst themselves. The interpretation consists in trying to rescue the said of such discourse from its passing moments and fix it in perusable terms. Okay, so what does this mean? He's putting said in quotation marks as well. Because, of course, not all significant behavior, not all um, semiotic behavior and action is done in words. His paradigm example is winking, right? So, so we know that significance is not just about language, that, that we can communicate significance in other ways as well. So then it's trying to rescue this whole sort of uh, scope of things that are significant, significant behaviors that we, things that we say, things that we do that have meaning, and then fixing it so that it occurs in a transient moment, but then we fix it by writing it down. He says, inscribing it specifically. And in perusable terms, meaning that others can come along later and uh, look at what it is that we have fixed. Uh, film could do the same thing. It doesn't need to be writing, right? So this is why he says uh, inscribing rather than writing. We can capture it on film. We can capture it in recordings. We can write it down. All of these different things. And then the last one, he says, is that it's microscopic. So then the anthropologist approaches more abstract interpretations and analyses through extensive familiarity with small matters, right? So he wants us to focus, again, on ordinary things, on ordinary life, on ordinary behavior, and to be extensively familiar with them. Why? <clears throat> because that extensive familiarity allows us to appreciate them as extremely dense. And it's that density of small matters, like the performance of a Y, right? That, that it might seem like that's a fairly uh, uncomplex thing, but that as we become familiar with it, we start to see that it's actually socially very, very dense, that there's a lot going on there. And it tells us a lot about uh, the way that Thai people interact with one another and, of course, with foreign anthropologists, but that's another issue. So he wants us then to be microscopic in our detail because these very, very dense, small social interactions tell us a tremendous amount. Anthropologists, he says, do not study villages so that if, if we think of our scope as being the village, we're not doing anthropology now, maybe geography or something like that, demography, but rather anthropologists study in villages. And there they study an aspect of social discourse in close detail. We'll see this in the next reading when we get to his analysis of the Balinese cockfight. The forces on anthropological uh, on anthropologists, uh, sorry, this forces on anthropologists a certain kind of modesty that we're not able to make sort of the grand theoretical gestures of say uh, a Karl Marx. Why? Because 
there's no assumption that your word, your interpretation, is the last word on a topic. Further interpretations uh, can layer on top of yours. And also, of course, the nature of sociality is that it changes. So that whatever you say, whatever you fix in your writing today will, will hold indefinitely into the future, not forever. There, there will come a time when the things that you're writing about will have lost their, their uh, immediacy for the world. So he says, ethnographic findings are not privileged, just particular. The important thing is their complex specific specificness, their circumstantiality. Again, to, to give uh, an example from my own work, when I was doing research in, in Thailand, I was looking at human rights, and I was doing it at a moment when um, there, there had been a coup that had been successfully resisted by huge popular demonstrations that had ushered in a moment of democratic rule that persisted for uh, around a decade. And during that time, there was a sense that the place of the military in public, in, in politics rather, had, had receded, that the uh, military, which has historically had a large role in Thai politics, had had been discredited to a large extent, that they no longer held the self-assurance that they ought to be involved in politics, and the public on the whole didn't share that view either. They also thought the military should be out of politics. And the result was then that there is a way that the newly formed National Human Rights Commission had the freedom to act and to disseminate human rights and to teach about human rights and to protect them where they had been violated uh, was, was quite large. They had a lot of freedom to do that. And so I wrote about a particular moment in the emergence of human rights in Thailand. Now, as it happened, uh, the year after I left, the military reasserted itself. There was a coup against a, a, a democratically elected government. And, uh, and since then, um, there has been this uh, increasingly um, autocratic rule in Thailand. The, the democracy has become much more of a kind of window dressing and less of uh, principle organizing political life in Thailand. So then this is a different moment. And while the Human Rights Commission still exists, it, it has shrunk. The, the number of commissioners was reduced uh, by the subsequent military governments. And the scope of what it could do has become narrower. Right? So you can see, even in just this short period, just a 15-year period, the nature of, uh, of the sort of a web of meanings to follow the, the metaphor around things like human rights has changed significantly. And so while I've captured in my work a particular moment fixed it, as Geertz would say, you can already see how a shift in the political environment in Thailand has made that work uh, lose some of its grip on what it can describe, that the webs of meaning have changed. And some of those strands have, say, uh, broken off and are no longer involved in sustaining the semiotic environment, the, the arena of meaning 
in which type you will behave. So then, specificness is both what gives an eth ethnographic account its importance, its salience, its meaningfulness, but that specificness also means that as social relations, ways of so relating socially change, th then that specificness will apply increasingly to a moment that no longer exists, that no longer holds. And so the description is going to increasingly be a description of something past. Now, it may be that the, um, the description is one that captures something that is more enduring about the webs of meaning. And therefore, it will be able to extend much further into the future. But that's not given in the description. That, that's a, a much more contingent question. So then complex speci specificity, in Geertz's view, is not a limitation on ethnographic ex insight because necessarily social actions are comments on more than themselves. A social action is not just referring to itself, but it is rather public. It sh it's involved in shared meanings, so it's a comment on all of those shared meanings. Where an interpretation begins, then, does not determine where it can go. Similarly, the interpretation that I give in my work um, doesn't determine the sort of descriptive force it's going to have in the future. As things change, that work will provide insights into the future that um, it couldn't have anticipated because it didn't know what the future was going to be. So the interpretation doesn't determine where it itself can go. That the nature of the social relations, the, the network of meanings, as it changes, that will shape where a particular interpretation can go. And so Geert sees two important traits of cultural interpretation in this respect. First, theory must stay close to the ground. He says, the whole point of the semiotic approach to culture is to aid us in gaining access to the conceptual world in which our subjects live so that we can, in some extended sense of the term, converse with them. And we only get that then by remaining, as he says, close to the ground, intimately connected to the social actors with whom we want to interact, who we want to understand, uh, with whom we want to converse. The implication for cultural theory is that it is not its own master. Why? It is beholden to the facts on the ground. It is, as he says, unseverable. You can't separate it from the immediacy of thick description, from the description of the webs of meaning that the subjects themselves weave. And therefore, it has this limited freedom to shape itself in terms of its internal logic, because the internal logic of the, of the interpretation has to answer to the interpretation shared amongst the social actors themselves. It's beholden to their interpretation. Once it tries to separate itself from that interpretation, it, it loses its descriptive power. Right? It is no longer an interpretation of their interpretations. It becomes increasingly sort of a flight of fancy of the ethnographer, him or herself. Further implication is that theory cannot build on itself under its own steam. So it's not like you start with a theory, you add another theory to it, and there's this linear progression of explanation you can get that in some other sciences, but not in this interpretive science. There's no cumulative progress from previously proven theorems to newly proven theorems. Rather, he thinks, a study shows advance only if it is more incisive than previous studies. So the way that we know that it's an advance is that it describes 
better. It describes more deeply what's going on within a community. It describes it more precisely, more accurately, such that if other people were to read a more robust, a more advanced um, description or study or interpretation, that should they then be amongst the people the study describes, that they will start off with a deeper insight into what's going on around them than if they were to rely on one of the previous studies that is less advanced. And this leads us then to the second condition of cultural theory. It differs from experimental sciences in that it is diagnostic rather than predictive, right? So a uh, study in um, astrophysics, let's say, will be able to predict when there will be a solar eclipse, right? It has that power that it is able by calculating physical forces and the, the movement of bodies in the solar system, it, that it is able to predict when eclipses will occur. That's not the work of interpretive anthropology or of cultural theory. It's diagnostic in nature. So it doesn't diagnose symptoms the way, uh, say, uh, a doctor would diagnose symptoms, but rather it diagnoses symbolic acts. And it does that Again, not to, to carry the metaphor, not to diagnose an illness, but to analyze social discourse. In this way, then, it doesn't create theory anew with each study, but it adopts theory from related studies and then refines it in the light of the new interpretive problems that it confronts. Right, So that it will borrow, then, from existing theory see how the theory fits. You could say that that's your guess at what's going on, and then adapt it so that your subsequent guesses are better, that they hold more explanatory power for understanding what it is that's going on in a given social situation. Ethno ethnographic theory then aims to provide a vocabulary in which what symbolic action has to say about itself, that is, about the role of cultural in, culture in human life, can be expressed. So to, again, get away from his introduction of clauses in the middle of sentences that can be uh, perhaps distracting, ethnographic theory tries to give us a vocabulary that will allow us to say what symbolic action or what cultural uh, the role of culture, says about itself. So we can understand better what it is that a group of people understands themselves to be doing and understands one another to be doing socially. Now, the fact that this role is not fixed means that cultural analysis is never complete, right? Because... As, as I was saying, uh, the social life that cultural analysis wants to describe and explain is always in motion. It's always changing. And so it's never going, there's never going to be a final point at which you, uh, at which you can come to rest, at which you can say, okay, this is the final analysis. Uh, in, in recent history in the U.S., we could look at the way that attitudes toward um, pot on the one hand or same-sex marriage on the other have changed in ways that a generation ago were completely unpredictable. No, nobody would have seen this coming in, say, the 1970s or the 1980s even. And so then if you were to try and satisfy yourself with a cultural analysis of the U.S., anchored in that moment, it just wouldn't hold for the current moment. Why? Because social relations change. The webs of meaning are not fixed in place. They shift. Why? Because we continually spin them ourselves. And so they change. They adjust. And therefore, 
our descriptions and our interpretations as anthropologists also have to change and adjust to keep up. Interpretive anthropology, he thinks then, strives simply to make available to us answers that others guarding other sheep in other valleys have given and thus to include them in the consultable record of what man has said. Now this is, I think in the end, he's making a fairly modest statement about about what interpretive anthropology strives to do. It just wants to give an account that can be consulted by others of what other people, as he says, guarding other sheep. So engaged in uh, their own distinctive webs of meaning have said, said being the metaphor here for engaging in any kind of symbolic action, what they have said and done. So that in his story, when Cohen goes and um, tries to capture a, a flock of sheep, that's a symbolic action for for Geertz. He he is saying something in that moment. He's engaging in a kind of meaningful behavior. All right, and so as we can see, there will be more on this next week. So the next week we'll start to see what it is that interpretive anthropology looks like done in an actual ethnographic context. <laughs>